Hound of the Bastables by A. Cullen Doyle. Chapter 6 Bastaville Hall. Sir Henry Bastaville and Dr. Mortimer were ready upon the appointed day. We started to arrange for Dudminster. Mr. Sherlock Holmes drove for me with me to the station, gave me the last passing injunctions of ice. They were not wise for my bed, Sir Jeffrey, so he took us in watching. Then he others who sent me to report back the point of possible matter for me. Will you leave me for doing this for Hurricane? What sort of facts? I asked. Anything which may seem to have a bearing have been direct upon the case, especially in relation to young Bastille, his neighbours, and his fresh particulars concerning the death of Sir Charles. I made our summer quarry myself in the last few days. The results have I fear been negative. One thing only appears to be certain that that, that, that is that Mr James Desmond, who is the next heir, is an elderly gentleman of very animal disposition. But that is his pers- that his persecution does not arise from him. That his persecution does not rise from him. I really think we should eliminate him entirely from our calculations. There remain the people who re- actually surround Sir Henry Bastille upon the moor. Would it not be well in the first place to get rid of this vulnerable couple? By no means we could not make a great mistake. If they are innocent, we could call in justice. If they are guilty, we should be giving up give out all chance of bringing it home to them. No, we will to serve them well them upon our list of suspects. Then there is a groom at the hall, if I remember right. There are two moorland farmers. There is our friend, Dr. Woodrow, who I believe to be entirely honest. There is his wife, of whom we know nothing. His nature is speculative. There is his sister, said to be a young lady of faction. There is Mr. Franklin, of Lafferty Hall, who is on a known factor. There is our one of the two neighbour neighbours. These are the folk who must be a very... Who you must be your very... Must be your very special study. I will do my best. You have my uh, you have arms, I suppose? Yes, I thought they might have repaid me. But I certainly keep them vulgar with me night and day, never lack your precautions. Our friends are ready to secure the first class carriage while waiting for us upon the platform. No, you have no time news no news of any kind, said Dr. Mortimer, in answer to my friend's question. I can swear to one thing. That is, we have not been showed during the last few, de- few days. We never have gone out without keeping a sharp watch, and no one could escape our notice. We have always kept together, I presume, except yesterday afternoon. I usually gave up, give up one day for a few movements. When I came to town, so I spent it in the museum of the College of Surgeons. I went to the look at the folk in the park, said Bastille, but we had no trouble of any kind. It's impertinent all the same, said Holmes, shaking his head, looking very grave, I beg, Sir Henry, that you will not go out about alone. It is some mis- great misfortune to befall you. If you do, did you get your other boot? No, sir, it's gone forever. Indeed, it's very interesting. Well, goodbye, then as the train began to glide down the platform. Bear in mind, Sir Henry, one of the phases of the queer old legend which Dr. Mortimer has read to us, avoid the more in those hours of darkness. The power of the evil exalted. I looked back the platform when we left it far behind, saw the tall and stir, stir figure of Holmes standing motionless, gazing after us. The journey was stiff and pleasant one. I spent it in making more intimate acquaintance with my two companions and playing with Mr. Otterwater's piano. Spanning with the very few hours, the brown earth had come ruddy, a brick had changed to granite, red crow cows grazed, their old hedge fields. Where the lush grasses more looped back to the vegetation, but the richer, the damper climate. Now the hills stared eagerly out of the windows and cried aloud at the light. We just recognised the similar scenery, features of Devon scenery. I've been over a good part of the world since I left it, joined Dr. Watson, said he. But I've never seen a place to compare with it. I never saw a Devonshire man who did not swear by his country, I remarked. It depends upon the breed of the man. Quite as much as on the on the, con- in the country. I rem- 
now Depends on the breed of man, quite as much about the country Dutch, said Dr. Mordor. Glance about a friend. Here were meals around his head, the kelp, which carries inside its work, characteristic of Suzerain. Power attachment, poor to the child's head, very rare and tight, half Greek, half Azabian, his characteristic. Though you are very, you were very young when you last saw back of the hall. Were you not? I was in my boy, in my teens, at the time of my father's death. You have seen Hall for where he lived, in a cottage on the south coast. Then so he went straight to a friend in America. I tell you, it's always new to me that Dr. Watson and King's Apostle see the mall. Are you? Do you wish to leave you granted for that is your first right the mall? said Lord Mordor, pointing out to the carriage window. Over the green squares of fields and low carved of wood. The rose in the distance of grey Montiel Hill, strange jagged summit, dim and vague, distant like some fantastic landscape in a dream best clear of track for a good long time his eyes fixed upon it and as i read upon his eager face how much it meant to him his first sight of that strange spot where men his blood had always held so long and left their marks so deep there he sat with a grave description of his american accent in the corner of a pathetic railway carriage and yet as i looked at his dark expressive face i felt more than ever in how true descendant he was a long line of fairy, high-blooded, fairy, fairy, and infernal men. There were pride, valour, strength, his thick brown, sensitive nostrils, his large, hazel eyes, his unknown forbidding, unknown forbidding more difficult and dangerous quest to lie before us, must at least the comrade yeah. from whom I ventured to take the risk, with the certainty that he was worthy to take care of it. Train pulled up with small wayward accretion, small up and small wayward station. We all descended outside, below the door, white fence, a wagonette, a pair of cobs was waiting. Our coming was evidently a great event. The stage of Martin Portland was clustered round to carry out our valley luggage. It was a sweet, simple cottage spot. The surprise was there, and by the gate there stood two soldiery men, dark uniforms, who leaned upon their short rifles, and glanced keenly at us as we passed. Coachman? Hard-faced girls, and who fell saluted to Henry Bessier. A few minutes we were swaying swiftly down the broad white road, rolling past it. Man's curled upwards on either side of us. Old gabled houses peered out of the, from amid thick green foliage. Behind the peaceful sunlit sunlit side, the rose ever dark among, against the evening sky, the long, curving, gloomy curve of the moor, broken by the jagged and sinister hills. The wagonet swung round it sideways, so sideways it was curved upward, through deep lanes worn by centuries of road, high banks on either side, heavy with dripping moss and head freshly, hearts, ferns, tongue ferns, bronze in bracken, mulches, bramble gleamed in the light of sleeping of the sleeping sun. Still steadily rising, we passed over a narrow granite bridge and skirted a noisy stream which gushed swiftly down, foaming and roaming amid the grey boulders. Both road and stream rose up through a valley dense with scrub oak and fir. At every turn Bessel gave an exclamation, a knight looking eagerly back and asking the captain a question. His eyes all seemed beautiful, but the meaning of tinge of melancholy lay upon the countryside, which bore a circadian mark of waning year. Their leaves covered it with rain, Flooded down and as we passed, the rattle of our wheels died away as we drove through the drifts of rotting vegetation. Fair gifts, it seemed to me, for nature to throw before carried the returning air a blessed relief. Oh, yeah, cried Dr. Hill, whatever. What is this? A steep cove of heath to the land, land of outlying spur of the moor lay in front of us, and the summit, hard and clear, like an Esquilian statue. Upon its pedestal was a mounted soldier, dark and stern. Rifle poles are ready over his half arm. He's watching the road along as he travels. What is this, Perkins? asked Montgomery. A driver half turned his seat. There is a convict escaped from Princeton, sir. He's been out three days now, and the warders watch every road and every station. But well, he had no sight of him yet. Farmers about here don't don't, don't like it, sir. That's a fact. I understand they give they get five pounds. They get they give him some information. 
Yes, sir, but the insurance of five pounds is about a poor thing. The insurance of having a boat cut, you see. It isn't like getting an illness from that. His man would stick at nothing. Who is he, then? He's sent in. The North and the North Hill murderer. I remember the case well, for it is one in which Holmes, taking interest, account of peculiar ferocity, crime, the wanted brutality, marked all the actions of the assassin. To him, in case mention, his death sentence, to induce with some doubt his complete sanity, as atrocious was his conduct. Madam Edward arrived in front of us, rose the heap of banks and more, rod of gnarled and craggy canes and pools. Cold wind swept down from it. It had set us shivering somewhere there on that desperate plain. He's looking to see this man hiding in the barrel like a wild beast, heart full of men. 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 against the whole race which he cast him out. Needed not but his complete and grim suggestiveness. Brown waste of chilly wind and dark east sky. Dark east sky. He best have felt solid and covered his overcoat more closely round him. He felt the fertile country behind, he left the fertile country behind and beneath us. We looked back on it now, the sunny range or low sun sunny in the stream, spread to gold and glowing on the red earth, next turned up by the plough, broad triangle of woodland. Right in front of us grew, bleak and wilder, over a hush, reckless and odd as smoke, sprinkled with the rain boulders, now only part of moorland cottage, walled and roofed with stone, no creature to break its path or outline. Line. Suddenly we looked down at a slight light depression, perched with studded oaks and firs, and big Christian bent by the furry trees. Years of furry of storms, years of storm, too high now its towers rose up over the trees, power pointed with his whip, with his whip. Birds did they all, we said. He. Martyr had risen, to stare with flushed cheeks and rising shining eyes. Three of the reached the lodge gates, a maze of French Catholic tracery, wrought iron, with a little bitten pillars on either side, blocked with lichens, surmounted by their boar's head, by Bastille. The lodge was ruined of black granite and bared ribs of plaster, and facing with a new building, half constructed, first fruits of child South African gold. Through the gateway you passed into the avenue, but the wheels were again hushed amid the leaves. The old trees shot their branches from a tunnel of our heads. Pascal shuddered. We looked up with a long, dark cry to where the house was remembered with a ghost at the farther end. Where is it? Well, what is it? What is it here? He asked in a low voice. No, no, that you, buddy. It's on the other side. And he had glanced around with a gloomy face. I wonder my uncle felt it was trouble were coming to him. Such a place as this, said he. Enough to scare any man. I have a row of electric lamps up there inside the trunk. You won't know it again. There are a thousand candlelights, one and lantern, right here in the front of the hall door. Now we open them. The broad expanse of turf and the house lay before us. Failing light to see the centre was a heavy block of building with set, which a port projected. The whole front was draped in ivory. A patch of clipped bare here and there with window. The window of coat of arms broke through the dark veil. Where the central block rose, the twin towers of ancient scintillated, pierced with many loopholes. To right and the left, a turret with more, more modern wings, black granite, a dull light strung through heavy, molten windows, and from the high chimneys which rose from the steeple. Steep, high angled roof, displaying a single high, black column of smoke. Welcome to Susan Winry, welcome to the best of them all. Two men. Tall men stepped out from the shadow of the porch to open the door. Ragonet, woman, silhouetted against the yellow light of the hall. She came out and helped the man, her hand down our bags. You won't mind if I drive you straight home, said Henry, said Dr. Mordwell. My wife is expecting. Surely you'll stay for some dinner. No, I must go. She'll probably find some work waiting for me. She'll stay to show you where over the house, but Barrymore, you're better guy than I. Goodbye. Never hate to think, night or day, certainly, if I can be of service. My lights died away down the drive while Sir Henry and I turned to the hall, a door clanging heavily behind us, to the fine apartment in which we found ourselves, large, lofty, and heavy rafted, huge bulks of grey, blackened oak, high, great old-fashioned fireplace, behind the high iron dogs, 
Low point of crackled and snap. Sending a nice hand in that old fan. And our hands to it. We've been down with our height from a high dry, long drive. Gaze around us. At a high, thin window, a lot of old stained glass, oak crannies, the flagged heads of the coats of arms upon the walls, all dim and sombre in the sublight, the light of the central hall. It's just as I imagined it, said Henry. It's not the very picture, very picture of old family old. I was to think this could be the same hall in which for 500 years my people have lived. It strikes me solemn to think of it. The solid boy, his face lit up with boyish enthusiasm. He gazed around him. A light beat about him where he stood. A long shadow trailed down upon the wall, hung like the black canopy upon him. Direct brambles had turned from taking our baggage to our rooms. He stood in front of us now. Two do men of a well trained servant. He was a remarkable looking man, handsome with a square black beard, pale, distinguished features. Would you wish to dinner? Will we serve at once, sir? Ready? In a few minutes, sir. Do you mind putting the hot water in your rooms? Will we, will we be happy, Sir Henry, to stay with you until you meet your fresh arrangement? Do you understand? Under new conditions, this house will call you his civil staff. What new conditions? I meant, sir, that I that Sir Charles led really proudly. We were able to look after his wants. You would naturally wish to have more company and do need charges in your household. You mean you and your wife you wish to sleep? Not only when you require to quite convenient for you, sir. You've only been with us several years, generations, have you not? I would be sorry to begin my life here, breaking up an old family connection. You see, this discern to a light's emotion upon the fair Spanish face. I feel, I feel that also, sir. And so does my voice, but to tell the truth, sir, we both very much attached to Sir Charles. Their figures are sharp, and maybe the surrounding very painful to us. I fear we shall never again be made easy our minds are better than But what do you intend to do? I have no doubt, sir, that we should succeed in establishing ourselves some business, Sir Charles. You don't think they have given us the means to do so. And now, sir, may I tell you, let's show you to your rooms. A fly of pistol gallery ran through the top of the old hall, approached by a durable stair. From this central point, two long corridors extended the whole length of the building, on which all the bedrooms opened. I own with the same wing of battery. I was next door to it. These rooms appeared to be much more modern. In the central part of the house, a bright paper, no Miss Kendall did something to remove the sombre oppression which our arrival left upon my mind. The dining room was much, which opened up to the hall, was placed as a shadow and growing gloom. Long chambers stepped, separating the dais where the family sat was for a lower portion reserved for their dependents. At the at one end of the stool gallery overlooked it. Black beams shot across the bogar our heads with smoke darkened ceilings beyond them. The rows of flaring torches were light up, made up with the colour and rude had hilarity of old time banquets. We might have shot him, for now when that black who black clothed gentleman sat in a little circle thrown light like thrown by a shaped lamp, my voice became hushed and one spirit subdued. Then like his ancestors, in very variant of dress. When the visible night, a buck of reachy stared upon us, a daunted on us. Yes, fine company, we talked little. I, for one, was glad when the meal was over. We were able to retire to a modern billiard room and smoke as light a cigar, cigarette. My word, it's not a very cheerful place, said Henry. I suppose one can turn it down. Turn down to it. I feel a bit out of, bit out of picture at present. I don't wonder why that my wonder was a man called Lily Jumpy is all over such a place as this. But if it suits you, we'll try it early tonight. Perhaps the things are seem better and more cheerful in the morning. It may seem even more cheerful in the morning. I drew aside my curtains before I went to bed, looked out of my window, as upon a grassy space which I laid out in front of the whole door. Beyond two corpses, the trees moaned and we swung in the rising wind. Half blown broke through the rifts of racing clouds. It lay on light that saw beyond the trees broken fringe of rocks, a low, long, low cur- curve of Mercury or more. I suppose the cut of seeing my last impression was in keeping with the rest. Yet it is not quite the last. I found myself weary, and yet wakeful, tossing with restlessly from side to side, seeking for a sleep which would not come. Following the chiming clock struck, called as the hours. At a while, at once, a 
for there's a deathly silence lay upon the old house. Then suddenly there arose a dead mate. There came a sound in my ears, clear, risen and unmistakable. It was the sob of a woman, a muffled, trembling grasp of one who torn by incomparable sorrow. Certainly in my bed and listened to intently. The noise could not have been far away, certainly in the house. For half an hour I waited, and every nerve and alert, and never came another sound save the tiny clock of rustle ivy on the walls. 